If you've been studying math for a while, you probably recognize this transcendental number e, but you might not know where it comes from or why you see it all over the place in math and math-rich subjects like physics and engineering. So where exactly does e come from and why should it be so pervasive? In this video, I'm going to approach this question from the perspective of differential equations. This simple equation right here, y prime equals y is really the key to understanding why e is everywhere. This equation says that the rate of change in some quantity y is equal to the amount, and it can actually be quickly adjusted to say the rate of change is proportional to the amount. And the reason why this equation pops up everywhere is precisely because it's so profoundly simple. Anytime you're modeling something where the rate of change is proportional to the amount, you're going to see this equation. And there are a lot of applications that are just slight modifications of that same idea. Now, geometrically, y prime equals y simply says that a function y is equal to its own derivative. In other words, the slope of the solution function is equal to the y coordinate of the solution function. So we're talking about a function where when the y coordinate is 1, the slope of the graph is 1. Then by the time the y coordinate is 2, the slope of the graph is 2. And we continue this way, we see that the slope is 3 when y is equal to 3, and the slope is 4 when y is equal to 4. And we have a bit of experience with functions that have this basic property that the bigger the y coordinate gets, the steeper the slope gets. And these are the exponential functions. So here we're checking out the exponential function 2 to the x on the left and 3 to the x on the right. And we're investigating the slopes to see what's going on here. So at y equals 1, we see that the slope of 2 to the x is a little bit less than 1. It's 0.693. And the slope of 3 to the x, that's a little bigger than 1. It's 1 1.099. Moving up to y equals 2, we see the slope on 2 to the x is a little less than 2. And the slope on 3 to the x is a little bigger than 2. And this same idea continues with y equals 3. The slope on 2 to the x is less than 3 while the slope on 3 to the x is a little bigger than 3. And there's y equals 4 just for the sake of completeness. So these two exponentials aren't going to solve our equation, but they are doing one thing right. The slope gets steeper as the y coordinate increases, but each of them fails to satisfy the equation y prime equals y. Our function on the left, y equals 2 to the x, has slopes that are always a little bit too shallow. And the function on the right, y equals 3 to the x, has slopes that are always a little too steep. So this begs the question, is there an exponential function with just the right base so that the slope is always exactly equal to the y coordinate? So we're going to propose the existence of an exponential solution that we'll call b to the x to our differential equation y prime equals y, and then we'll see if we can figure out what the perfect base b is to make this work. Note that we already expect this Goldilocks base to be some number between 2 and 3. So now we're ready to derive an expression for our special base. So remember, what we're trying to do is solve the differential equation y prime equals y. And what we're proposing is that the solution is an exponential function with an unknown base of b. So what we're going to do is apply the limit definition of the derivative. On the left-hand side here, we have our function b to the x. And on the right-hand side, we have the derivative of b to the x. We're just saying y is equal to the derivative of y. So that's our usual limit definition of the derivative, the limit as h goes to 0, of our function evaluated at x plus h minus the function evaluated at x, all divided by h. Now we can factor a b to the x out of the numerator of that expression inside the limit, and x is a constant with respect to the h limit. So the b to the x can be factored out of that whole limit. So we arrive at this equation, b to the x equals b to the x times the limit as h goes to 0 of b to the h minus 1 divided by h. And because b to the x is never equal to 0, we can divide it out of both sides, and we arrive at this equation. 1 is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of b to the h minus 1 over h. So now the problem is, how do we solve for the b inside that limit? And this one's a little bit tricky. We actually have to use an approximation approach to this. So what I'm going to say is, if this limit turns out to be 1, then b to the h minus 1 better be getting really close to h as h goes to 0. In other words, the inside of that limit is approaching h over h in the small h limit. So we make an approximation. b to the h minus 1 is approximately equal to h, provided h is very, very small. In other words, as h goes to 0. 
And now we can start working on solving for b. So we start by adding 1 to both sides, and we find b to the h is approximately 1 plus h, again, provided h is very close to 0. And then we can raise each side to the 1 over h power to isolate b. So we find that b is approximately equal to 1 plus h raised to the 1 over h power, provided h is very small. Now this allows us to re-express b as a limit. Again, that approximation was valid, provided h was very close to 0. So we could just say b is equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 plus h all raised to the 1 over h power. So at this point, we've solved for the mystery base that it takes to solve the differential equation y prime equals y. But this begs the question, does that limit converge? And we're not going to provide a formal proof of convergence here. We're just going to sub in a bunch of really small values of h and show that the limit appears to be approaching some finite number. So we set up the usual table for approximating limits. I have one column for h values, another column for 1 plus h raised to the 1 over h. And when I sub in this really small h of 1 thousandth, my expression 1 plus h to the 1 over h turns out to be about 2.71692. Just keeping five decimal places here. Now we go to 1 10 thousandth or 0 0.0001 and the value of our expression is 2.71815. We go smaller again by a factor of 10 and we get 2.71827. And now we go all the way to h equals 1 millionth and we arrive at 2.71828, which you should recognize from the opening slide of this video. So the limit defining our special base b appears to be converging to a finite number, and we're happy. And now it's time to give a name to this thing. So we're going to define e as the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 plus h to the 1 over h. That's the special base that makes it so an exponential function e to the x solves the differential equation y prime equals y. Now note that it's worth remembering this limit definition of e if you're a calculus student. You're going to repeatedly see this in calculus classes and in physics classes where you'll occasionally run into a limit that looks like this and you just have to recognize it as the definition of e. Okay, so here's a quick review of what we've accomplished so far. First, we have a definition for this special number e. The limit is h goes to zero of one plus h raised to the one over h power. And I put an asterisk on that guy because there's actually an alternative way of defining this, and I'll get to that in just a second. So number two, we have a decimal approximation for this thing of about 2.71828. That's a non-repeating decimal. And third, remember this whole thing originated with trying to solve the differential equation y prime equals y. And we were looking for the special base that would get that done. So y equals e to the x solves that differential equation. And another way to say that is that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. This is the special function that's equal to its own derivative. So what about that asterisk? If we take the limit definition of e and we make a substitution letting n equal 1 over h, then as h goes to 0 from the right, n is going to positive infinity. So we can reformulate this definition as a limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus h, but solving for h in our substitution there, h is 1 over n. So it's a limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n. And then that whole thing is raised to the nth power. Now in practice, I seem to see these two definitions of e in about a 50-50 ratio. So it's good to be familiar with both of them. So now we can generalize a little bit to make this natural exponential function more useful. First, we notice that a constant multiple of e to the x is also a solution to the equation y prime equals y. And the proof of that is really quick. If you take the derivative of c e to the x, where c is some constant, well, the derivative doesn't care about constant multiples. So I just get c times the derivative of e to the x. But e to the x is the function equal to its own derivative, so I end up with c e to the x. So what we just showed there is that y prime in the first step is equal to y in the last step. Therefore, it solves the differential equation. Second, let's see what happens if we look at a function like y equals c e to the kx, where k is some constant. And what I'm claiming here is that that solves the differential equation y prime equals ky. And again, the proof isn't so bad. We just differentiate the proposed function ce to the kx, but derivatives don't care about constant multiples, so that's c times the derivative of e to the kx. And then we have to recognize e to the kx is a function composition where kx is the inner function of that composition. So we differentiate with respect to kx. 
that just gives us e to the kx. But then the chain rule says we have to tack on the derivative of kx with respect to x. And that throws a factor of k out in front of this thing. Well, that final expression we're looking at is k times y, where y was the original function. So c e to the kx solves the differential equation y prime equals k y. And this is one huge contributing factor to e appearing everywhere in math and physics. This equation says that the rate of change in a quantity is proportional to the amount. And this is precisely what we expect from modeling growth, as in population growth and compound interest, which we both refer to unsurprisingly as exponential growth. But it also works for exponential decay phenomena, like nuclear decay and the discharging of a capacitor, among many, many other simple models that we see in physics, biology, chemistry, economics, and engineering. Now, one final reason that we see E everywhere in mathematics is that any exponential function can be written in terms of the base E. So given just some arbitrary exponential function b to the x, we can modify this by writing it as e to the natural log of b to the x. Remember, the natural log function is the inverse of e to the x. So e to the natural log of anything is the same as that thing. So b to the x is the same as e to the natural log of b to the x. Now we can use log properties and pull that x out as a multiplicative factor. So now we have an e to the natural log of b, then multiplied by x. Well, that looks exactly like an e to the kx. So any exponential can be written in terms of e this way. And e is the natural choice of exponential base because e to the x solves the simplest differential equation, y prime equals y. So this special number e is going to pop up anytime we're studying exponential functions. In the next video, we learn how to differentiate exponential functions, and we get a lot of practice combining exponential function derivatives with the chain rule. I'll post a link to that video at the upper left of the end screen, and I'll see you there.